Jory, and I don't know. I think they're, they're just super awesome, and they're the co-founders of Blogger. So please welcome them onto stage. Come on down, ladies. Here again. Congratulations. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Please. What a great event. Thanks. Hey, everybody. I'm Lisa. I'm Jory. When we're two of the three co-founders of Blogger. Our co-founder, Elisa Camahort Page, is actually headed out to Miami today to host Blog Her Food. We're the third largest food network, and we'll have five to 600 people drinking and eating hard in Miami. Yeah, so Come join us. We love you that much that we're here. So I think we have we someone actually have who's- We a moderator, but we could just talk forever. Too. As we do, as we have been for 10 years. Uh, how many of you have your own companies? Excellent, congratulations. I'm, our, our hearts and thoughts are with you. How many of you are venture capitalists? We'll get more of those next year, maybe. There's one. How right. many of you have co-founders? Right on. Co-founders. You all, more hands when you have co-founders? Yes, OK. Um, and how many of you heard David Hornick speak this morning? Excellent, brilliant man. And did you all hear Guy speak? Yeah. Excellent. He's brilliant, right? Um, well, I just want to ask the conference leaders to confirm whether or not we're going to be interviewed or we should riff on the subject of partnership because uh, we could go on all day. We could. Are you, and we answer questions. Are we going to be interviewed or? <laughs> all right. Right on. It's a fresh canvas. So um, <laughs> should we start by... Uh, Asking uh, a couple of questions about what you all want to hear, we'll tell you a little bit about our business, and then let's just make it a big Q and A yeah. session. Is We've been at this at this uh, entrepreneur thing for over nine years. Yes, ten just years. Just for a little bit of background, so that's I know that we were going to talk a bit about longevity, which is not the first word that comes to mind uh, in, in the valley, <laughs> but it. But for those of you who actually want to create sustainable companies, I hope we can be of help. Yes, we would love to. So really quickly then, Blog Her uh, started in 2005 as a, a crazy idea. The three of us wanted to answer the question, where are the women who blog? And then we were going to go back to our lives as professional bloggers. It was a labor of love. And in four months, we pulled together a conference, accidentally made $60,000, and 305 women came from four continents and said, please help us be paid for our writing. And we said, you're on. Today, flash forward, Blogger reaches 100 million women a month. We have a massive distributed community of contributors. We use a scalable technology platform that embraces the influence of women on every social medium, including blogs, and is dependent upon none of them. Over the past five years, we've paid 6,000 roughly different bloggers about $36 million in advertising revenue shares and work for hire. Thank you. Um, we are thank break, you. thank you. We are uh, break even slash operating profitably, depending on the quarter. I'm the CEO, uh, as well as one of the co-founders. And Jory is the person who built the conference business initially and has been in charge of our relationships with a Fortune 100, as well as sitting on the IAB board. And we have been through one recession and roughly 55 uh, turnarounds in the industry, new technologies, platforms, et cetera. So um, we've, we've kind of been through a number of changes and, uh, and know that we can offer up some, some advice there as well in the shifting industry. We've Around expanded. Mobile. We've contracted. <laughs> At our largest, we were probably 68 employees. We're about 54 employees yeah. now. We started as an LLC. We bootstrapped for two years. We raised $20 million in venture capital. That's all. And if you look at the women's space, that's nothing. In our space, it's lean. Very lean. Um, and uh, we all uh, three have the same amount of stock in the company. So that's we're willing to be very frank with you here today. So we would love to hear um, a little more about your questions. Yes, ma'am. Yes, come on down. <laughs> Thank you for being a microphone wrangler. Your work is holy. And I would just love to hear your name, your company, if you want, and then your question. 
Hey guys, uh, my name is Melinda Byerly. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Vendorsi. And I think we can safely say, Lisa and Jory, that you guys are crushing it. Oh, thank you. So glad to have you guys here today. Could you talk, I would love to hear you talk about, my co-founder, uh, Stefan, is here with me today. How you guys talk about um, when you, how you do with conflict. You often be asked that in pitching, you know, have you had your first real fight yet? How'd you resolve it? <laughs> After this many years, you've had fights, so maybe let's talk about it. Right, so can you all hear the question? Is the audio working? What was our first real fight? Um, so Elise always says, you know, we've always fought fair, Yeah. right? Here's an interesting fact. All three of us come from families with three girls and one boy. <laughs> interesting, right? So we all grew up with people that if we beat the tar out of them, we had to eat dinner with them later, right? Um, why don't you take that? So, uh, <laughs> so it's funny you say that because a, a common question I get from other founders is they, you know, it's like a marriage, right? And so that it's like, you guys are still together after all these <laughs> years. And we haven't gone to counseling, but I do think that there are rules of engagement. And mm -hmm. we were just asked that backstage, actually. What happens when you have a disagreement? We, I, I can't. We've, ne we've had disagreements throughout the years. I mean, there's no way we could ever be always in sync. Uh, I'd say that, that probably when we first started the company, we all, you know, this is where the rosy period where you have this shared vision and then, you know, the world happens. And you have to start to make uh, decisions based on new information. And this is where the new information actually creates some disagreements. One thing that we did very early on, because we all had to come into the company as generalists, I would say, right? We, we kind of did it all. As we got bigger, that just wasn't sustainable, and we had to divvy out roles. And so whether or not we knew we were going to be the expert of an of a area, we became the expert of an area. Elisa runs our marketing, right? And she, she runs our events. Lisa is our CEO. She handles the investors, among other things, and product. I handle our advertisers. So we started to uh, build areas of expertise. And those areas of expertise have since then, uh, since 2006 or seven, when we got our first round of funding, have since splintered off even more. But because we had to develop those areas of expertise, we do defer. Doesn't mean we always agree with, but when we have decisions that need to be made, we still have to agree and we come together on those, but we defer to the expert to help make the informed choice. So I don't make calls about our PR. I defer to Elisa. She usually gets agreement from us, but I respect her expertise in that area. And it has certainly helped with a number of these vision and bigger picture uh, decisions that have come across our plate over the years. I quite agree with that. And the question is, when you do disagree, how do you disagree? And there are three key ways to do it. Number one, it's important to feel strong, passionate emotion about your company and to argue about product or to argue about PR or to argue about what a sponsor should be allowed to have. But the second that you're thinking, saying, or acting as though you are driving me crazy, you're no longer talking about the product. You're making it personal. That's bad partnership, that's bad parenting, that's bad all kinds of things, yeah. don't, don't do it. Secondly, it's really fantastic to work in new media as media people because the metrics don't lie, you know? I mean, I can say all day long in the advertising space that pharma should be working with social media with people who have standards, but until you've seen that blogs that talk about the one in six American couples having trouble conceiving, and those are the longest internet sessions that you see on blogs, they're minutes and minutes and hours, then you're not really making your case. So making our case to each other with metrics, depersonalizing it, it's really key. And the third thing is, if someone's out of line, I mean, you gotta, you gotta say so. Like, I'm, not, I'm actually not really comfortable with that. I feel like we're having a conversation about X, Y, or Z instead of a conversation about this product, what's going on, you know? So that's great question. Yes, yeah. sir. Oh, I'm sorry. This gentleman and then this next gentleman. Thank you. Hi. Hi. My name is Andrew Nguyen. I'm from Dallas, Texas. I build uh, software for SmartWatch. Uh, I have two questions for you. Uh, one is, uh, on, on the first stage, uh, when did you decide to, to raise the fund and investment and how you do that? And second is uh, about change management issues. As, as the company grow and, and the industry change, how you uh, innovate and at the same time keep the business scalable uh, mm -hmm. without losing focus. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Great question. So I'm going to take the first one, start the second one, and then you can finish off the second one because yep. you're really at the front of that. So um, we bootstrapped for two years. We thought we were going to hold a conference and go home. We didn't expect to start a media company. We decided to raise capital when, at the end of two years, we had a waiting list of bloggers 1,000 blogs long. And we also had unmet demand from advertisers who said, we'd like you to be 100 times bigger so we could give you real advertising budgets. We're not playing around in this, in this social media space with women. We want to do it. And we looked at each other, and we finally decided that it would kill us if someone else raised money to do what we were doing, because we thought we were doing it better. Creating a new kind of media company by, for, and with the community, instead of packaging up a bunch of stuff about lipstick and parenthood and shoving it at women, we thought this was really different. And our community was very, very much willing to sign up for the quality standards that we needed to work with Fortune 10 companies. So we began the process of reaching out to people we knew. We had both worked with startups before, as had Elisa. We had a network of pre-existing people who could help us get to people. We made a decision early on that we were going to put our finances together with a group of people, my friend Jan Reed, with whom I shared a nanny eight, like 18 years ago, does acting CFO stuff out of Silicon Valley Financial Group. She helped us put together real, correct financials. They do an excellent job, by the way. I have to promote them. We no longer work with them because we have our own you know, internal CFO. But they helped us know what our margins were, know what our revenue goals were, know what our cogs would be, and go in and be able to talk about a business that was already operating. And that was key. So the reason we knew David Horneck and Guy Kawasaki from the beginning was that we had worked very hard to get to know people in the space and get great advice. I knew from the beginning we were not going to have 87% margins like a software company, right? But no media company does. And if media companies say they have them, they're wrong. <laughs> so we got credibility, and that was key. Um, we have evolved this model consistently over the past 10 years. We are not the company we started to be. We have a scalable technology platform now. And we go out and we're able to guarantee earned media. And that has a lot to do with our flexibility. We will continue to change. This company will not be the same company in two years or 10 years. But Jory's been at the epicenter of that change, so I thought maybe you could talk a little bit about it. Yeah, I could speak about an applied example when we had to make some organizational changes. We weren't, the business was not going to stay something that the three of us knew intimately at yeah. all times. And for instance, in the media business, you, you may have heard of, of the rise of native and programmatic. Programmatic is an interesting, growing, emerging part of the media business. It's, uh, it's automated, it's data-driven, and as much as we appreciate that, we did not have that expertise, so we had to go out and get that. And I think we, we constantly are asking, what don't we know? That, is, that has to happen all the time. I look for someone who literally, I mean, who's smarter than me in this regard. I mean, hopefully I'm smarter than him and some others, but I said You're to him, smart. I said to him, just tell me what I don't know. That's how, you know, walk me through. I'm going to ask questions like I'm five, not like, you know. I, and I think that there's a little ego that goes in when you're starting a company to have to know it all already, but you can't grow that way. Uh, and I find just he just started, and I'm learning every single day. And, and that's been our approach with anything, especially now that we're technology-driven and we're building our own technology. We need people who are smarter than us to help us do that. Great question. Yes, sir. Um, my name is Peng Shao. I'm from a startup company called AR Devices. Um, so let's start to talk about some money. Uh, it's rare to hear that uh, all the co-founders the, uh, carry the same share uh, of the whole company. Mm -hmm. So um, when we talk with uh, VC and they're all shaking their hands, uh, their hands for um, one people must be like leading the company. And is, uh, how, how did you survive with, uh, when you start to talking with a VC or uh, the whole procedure. Got a little feedback. I want to make sure there's a little feedback up here. Can I make sure and restate your question so that I've got it? Sure. You're saying it's unusual for people to have the same amount of shares in the company in the partnership. Why did we make that decision, and how has that changed or been tested as we've been evolving as a company? Yes, yes. Our company, personally, we have uh, six people, and we take the same share, too. So that's maybe... Oh, you do the same thing? Yes. All six have the same number yes. of shares. Wow. Yes. Oh, I have a total story for you. Okay, that's great. So. Um, <laughs> Couple of things. So um, this is not our first rodeo, okay? 
I was the editor-in-chief at women.com and the first bubble helped put 11 Hearst magazines and two Rodell magazines online, watched that company be sold to iVillage, and then went off to Harvard on a Neiman Fellowship to spend time at MIT and HBS to study the way women were emotionally using this space. How were they interacting on games? How were they interacting on IRC? Uh, message boards were the first realm of social media, right? And during that time, I made some decisions because I'd been at a startup for four years. I, had, I was a single mother of a, of a, a five-year-old boy by the time I got to, to Harvard, and I decided three things. Number one, um, single founders weren't workable. There was no way you could be as smart as you needed to be. You had to have partners. Number two, I wanted to spend as much time with my son as I could before he left home. There is not enough time. So since I wasn't the be all end all and I wanted to have a life, I decided I wanted, if I did anything again, if I ever started anything, it would be with co-founders. When the three of us met, um, we worked so hard on that first conference bootstrapping it and we found that we all worked as hard as each other. We were completely trustworthy. We all had the company checkbook and we were, again, fighting fair. It was that, that good fit. And so it was something that I proposed that we were all very comfortable with, and it was very yeah. valuable. And since then, we've actually, you know, there are three different marriages and two more children, <laughs> more four more children in the mix. And I mean, it's like been very beneficial to my personal life, I have to say. But the last very thing productive. I can tell you is that when we've raised money, there was one round where I was offered 4% more stock than my co-founders. And I said, please divide it up. Please divide it up equally. And they said, we thought you'd say that. Now, what is the chess game behind making the decision that I made? Who wants to answer that? What's, why, what decisions that you, sir? Right. So the, the, the response from the gentleman is, I didn't want to create hard feelings. I didn't want to drive a, a wedge between the founders, right? Any other ideas? Yes, ma'am. I wanted work-life balance, and I didn't want to have to work 4% harder than <laughs> the rest of the founders. That, that's, and we would have held her to that 4%. Yeah, right. Did, was there another? Yes. Yeah, you and you, and then, and then I'll give another answer. The personal relationship meant more, and the value was more to than the 4%. Personal relationships meant more to me, and I valued them more than I did the 4%. Okay, sir? I to the the Pardon me? A chess player. You are right. Everyone, he said, it puts up a dynamic, it creates a dynamic between the founders and the investors. Every single one of you is right. My integrity matters enormously to me. I would never trade my relationships with my co-founders for my integrity. And yes, I did like the way we were working together and it was working for my life, although we're all working a lot more than I ever expected to. However, you all have hit on the critical issue. How do investors disrupt and take over a company led by founders. They drive a wedge between the founders first. They separate the herd. And then all of a sudden, you don't have a voting group of founders that controls a certain block of stock. You have dissension. And we've all read that book, right? So by deciding that we were going to, I was going to be consistent, and we were going to be consistent, behaving consistently breeds trust. We have often said we are building a trust economy with the community. The first trust economy was between the three of us. That's just my opinion, though. What do you think? I didn't fully grok all of that at the time. I'm so, like, thank you. Um, the, I do want to just acknowledge, though, because there are different partnerships that, that are in play, and sometimes there is someone with a, lot more, with a lot more experience, and these things happen, right? If you... If this is your fifth startup and you're bringing you know, someone right out of college who's got that technical expertise, you may want to rethink that balance. Mm -hmm. But the point is, you have to be fair. 
Um, and sometimes it's not an equal share situation, but if you're not fair, it will bite you. If you look at the different uh, partnerships, there's a great book out there called The Founder's Dilemma uh, by Noam, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just forgot his last name, but he's a Harvard professor and he looks at, particularly in the Valley, tens of thousands of partnerships and co-founder relationships and looks at what works and what doesn't. And there are some key areas where the ones that are more likely to break up, what has happened? Family, friends and family, because of course you're, you, you know them as friends and family, then you get together, you take their money, and then there's some situations. You're not aligned on a, on a strategic business vision. Um, but also when there is inequity somehow involved in the founder shares. So it doesn't mean it has to be totally fair, but if you are not giving a, a co-founder, as a co-founder you are not offering uh, the share that, it, that you feel you bring to that company, it will eventually come into play. And when you have that next round or you're having that next discussion, that's where things start to blow up. Another book, just quickly, I don't know if you guys have had recommended today, Venture Deals. Uh, everybody knows about that book by Brad Feld and Jason Mendelson. It's a must read, second edition, and of course, Guy's book. So, there's a question up here too, just so you know. Okay, you okay. sir, and then you. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Renan. I, I'm a founder of Play. It's a subscription that works with families and mommies to provide educational toys, Lego primarily. Awesome. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned about the changing of the industry, and uh, over the last 10 years, you've seen the blogosphere obviously expanding enormously, and they also becoming a lot more commercialized. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that bloggers overall kind of uh, lose a little bit of their in independent individual voice because of that? That is such an important question. So the question is, do bloggers risk giving up their credibility or their communities if they become over-commercialized? From the beginning, we have insisted on th uh, community guidelines that follow the highest tenets of American magazine or newspaper editors' journalism, full disclosure of any compensation, cash, goods, benefits, what have you, textually and visually. And then finally, we insist that all of our bloggers uh, manage their comments and their own content for hate and harassment, right? We don't allow it. That's poisonous, and we don't want to get behind that kind of writing. You can hate an idea, but not the ideator. Um, for the 3,000 bloggers and 12,500 different influencers we work with, we work very hard to recommend that they pace their recommendations and that they never write about or talk about something that they don't feel like they can fully put their good word behind or is appropriately integrated with their community because that a trust economy and their good ad advice is worth gold to them. Jory represents us a lot with brands. Yeah, I wanted to answer from the brand perspective because when we're talking about disruptions, one of the major disruptions as the blogosphere was taking off are of course the additional platforms that have been added to the mix, but also the technology is smarter. So from the advertising perspective, they want more than just hits, follows, they want engagement. And yeah. if you cannot provide that, those metrics, then you don't get the play from the, from the uh, advertisers. So with that technology, we had to actually even get better at what we yeah. were doing. We had to figure, we already knew how to get engagement, now we had to package it. And I would say that um, part of the process was also educating the, uh, the influencers on how mm -hmm. to get that engagement. If you weren't developing a community along with your, with your site and you're just getting, you know, you're, you're setting up links because you know people will click through, it will play out in the end. So I think that the technology actually brought us into a better place overall. So I would recommend people come to the blogger.com promotions page and click through on some of the promotions to see what we feel is appropriate and worth paying for from the brand side. Um, and we, you know, we get behind all of our bloggers editorially. So thank you for asking. I'm not sure how much more time we have, but there was one question in the West. front. Oh, I thank yeah. both of you for being here today. You're very, Stand. very interesting. My name is Jamana. I handle the Better Business Bureau from Stanford University all the way to Sacramento. Oh, what a great job. I would like job. to know how you feel about her and her answer that she gave about the 4%. Is that something you were expecting because you know each other very well and work well, together? Well, we talked about it. I just didn't ha have all of those answers. I figured, I mean, she's always been ridiculously fair. So 
I expected that, and I knew that she had been offered that, but I didn't really think about the, the whole chess game with, with the investors, but you're absolutely right, having gone through around the block a few times. So I think that's what surprised me, is that there was a, a lot more thinking behind it other than you know, Lisa insisting on her usual fairness. You're great, you complement each other. I thank you for coming today. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, thank you, thanks everybody. Ladies, uh, I want